Welcome all listeners to this uh, webinar presentation. The topic of this presentation is high resolution carbon isotope analysis of three rings using laser ablation isotope ratio mass spectrometry. My name is Elina Salstedt and I'll be giving this presentation together with Katja Rinne Karmsten. We work at the Stable Isotope Laboratory of Luke. Uh, LUKE is an abbreviation of the Finnish name for the Natural Resources Institute, Finland. I will start this presentation with some background information on stable isotope analysis and analysis of three rings specifically. I will shortly introduce the operational principle of the instrument and describe how the laser ablation IRMS compares with conventional analytical methods. After this, Katja will take over and talk more about how we, uh, how we have utilized this analysis method on different research questions. But first, a few words about the laboratory. We are located in Helsinki, Finland, uh, and the Stable Isotope Laboratory was founded in 2018 in collaboration with the Finnish Food Authority. The laboratory was founded as a part of the Isoboreal project, which we will talk more about later in this presentation. The Isoboreal project and the laboratory are both headed by Dr. Katja Rinne Karmsten. And uh, I act as the laboratory manager of SIL, and I worked in collaboration with the instrument manufacturers Teledyne and Circon, and later Terra Analytic, who built us the laser cell. Uh, to establish the stable carbon isotope analysis method uh, with the system. And in this uh, figure, you can see, see the lab and the IRMS here and the laser ablation system here on the left hand side of the instrument. Now, before I talk more about the analytical method and the instrument, I'll say a few words on how we use stable isotope composition in tree ring research. Uh, like all stable isotope applications, we take advantage of the systematic way the isotopes of some uh, specific elements behave in nature. So because there is a small difference in the masses of the isotopes, for example, between carbon-13 and carbon-12, there is a tendency of these uh, isotopes to redistribute in, for example, chemical reactions. So basically what we, do, we would observe is a shift in the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. And we call this a redistribution fractionation. Now take, for example, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, it has a stable isotope, carbon stable isotope composition of approximately minus 8 per mil, given in the delta notation. And the delta notation is just a way of uh, giving the isotopes a composition of a substance a relative, to a, a relative to a reference point, uh, a reference material uh, whose isotope composition is known. So, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is used by the plant in photosynthesis. Uh, but in order for the plant to be able to use it, the carbon dioxide first have, has to migrate in the uh, place where the reaction uh, takes place that forms the sugars. So the carbon dioxide diffuses into the plant uh, through the plant stomata into the leaves and then is used in reactions to form sugars. And both of these uh, uh, phases or processes uh, fractionate. So the diffusion of the carbon dioxide into the leaves and the reactions that form the sugars. And the end result is that the uh, delta 13 C value of the sugars is somewhere around minus 25 to minus 30 uh, per mil, typically. So in this instance, uh, there is more carbon-12 
relative to carbon-13 in the sugars compared to the atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, these sugars uh, are tra transported from the needles and into the uh, other uh, parts of the plant. For example, into the stem of the plant or the trunk of a tree, where these sugars are used to uh, uh, grow, the, grow the trunk. And uh, the wood that is formed will inherit the uh, carbon isotope composition of the sugars. Uh, there might be some minor alterations uh, due to secondary fractionation processes and stuff like that. But the wood will uh, usually reflect also the carbon isotope composition of the sugars. Now, the plant can uh, modify its behavior uh, according to changes in the environment. And these changes uh, can cause shifts in the uh, carbon, isotopes compos uh, carbon isotope composition of the sugars. For example, temperature, humidity, light conditions can alter the uh, responses of the, of the plant in such a way that we will see, see a shift in the carbon isotope compositions. Uh, now looking more closely at the stem of the plant, so in this case, uh, the stem of a tree. As in this image, you can see a cross section of uh, tree rings. So each of these light to darker brown bands represents one year or a one growing season. The band in the middle is approximately one millimeter uh, thick. The yearly growth starts with these lighter colored uh, early wood cells. Uh, and ends with these uh, thicker walled, uh, dark brown colored late wood cells. So what is interesting about this uh, structure is that as the tree grows during the growing season, uh, these uh, cells will record the changes in environmental conditions uh, as the growing season proceeds. So you can uh, look at this growth both annually, so looking at the whole growing season, or you can look at it sequentially, uh, going uh, from one end of the ring to the other end of the ring. So the conventional sampling strategy uh, for isotope studies is to cut, uh, cut these rings out of the sample and, and analyze the isotopic compositions from these uh, cuttings. Uh, the conventional way is to either select the whole annual ring or separate these uh, rings into early wood and late wood parts. So you can see in this image I have uh, cut the rings uh, in the early wood and late wood parts. Selecting uh, the conventional sampling strategy uh, then reduces the uh, whole year's growth into two or one data points, depending on what you are uh, separating. And in many cases, in many studies, this is enough. Uh, you only need the one or two data points per, per annual year. Uh, but in some cases, uh, we are interested also to see uh, how the carbon delta 13C uh, signal uh, changes uh, throughout the year in high resolution. And uh, this high resolution uh, can be an achieved uh, by using laser ablation as the sampling and combining this laser ablation to isotope ratio mass spectrometry. So in this case, you can see the ablation lines on the same ring. So this, uh, instead of having the one or two data points, uh, we will get 17 data points for this one, uh, one yearly growth. And this image shows the 
basic layout of the instrument uh, that we use. On the left hand side, uh, the boxes represent the laser ablation instrument and the specially made uh, isoshell uh, laser uh, chamber. And this uh, uh, laser, ch uh, laser cell is connected to a mini combustion unit and a cryoprep uh, preparation system, which is then connected to the uh, isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Uh, and the whole analysis is done online. So we have the solid sample in the laser cell and we use the laser instrument to ablate the material. Uh, we use the combustion unit uh, to turn this, uh, uh, this wood dust into gases, carbon dioxide, and uh, a small amount of uh, water. And we separate uh, the water from the gas flow and use the cryoprep unit uh, to collect the carbon dioxide. So because the uh, laser ablation system releases the sample in a stream of dust, we also get a stream of carbon dioxide coming from the sample. So this carbon dioxide needs to be collected into one pulse. And this is done in the cryoprep, a unit which has a liquid nitrogen uh, trap. And then uh, this uh, trap is warmed and the uh, carbon dioxide pulse is released into the isotope ratio mass spectrometer, uh, which is uh, the last box of the system. Now is a good time to compare these two methods, uh, the laser uh, ablation IRMS and the conventional methods. So as you can imagine, the conventional methods are both labor and time intensive, uh, necessarily so, because you need to do the separation by hand. Uh, in addition, you also need to do uh, probably sample homogenization, uh, sample weighing, and wrapping these samples uh, separately into thin capsules that can be introduced into the, for example, elemental analyzer. So this takes uh, quite a lot of time. Uh, but if you remember from the earlier images of the three rings, uh, perhaps you remember that they were quite uh, even. So the ring boundaries were straight. So in these cases, uh, you can imagine that it is possible to sequentially uh, cut the rings. So you could have uh, more than one or two data points per ring, but this, of course, just means a lot of more uh, time uh, used on the separation process. However, uh, some features are not uh, accessible with, for these conventional methods. For example, you can see here uh, in the middle of this image, uh, these two quite narrow rings. Uh, these are rings years 1964 and 1965. Uh, when you look at these boundaries, ring boundaries, you will see that they are bending uh, unevenly even. Uh, the year 1965 is approximately 30 to 40 micrometers wide. So you can imagine and it, that this is this is impossible to separate uh, accurately using conventional methods. So by using laser ablation, these types of uh, these type types of features in the tree rings are accessible. You can actually analyze uh, both of these ring, uh, rings relatively easily. There are a couple of things that. Uh, one should keep in mind concerning the laser ablation IRMS method. Well, the first thing would 
probably be that the with this uh, method it's quite easy to obtain very high resolution data from tree rings because you have ability to have multiple analysis per ring and also you can uh, you can select your analysis points according to the ring structures you can you see in the uh, in your sample for example in this image you can see the false ring uh, at, in the middle of the uh, yearly growth so you can quite easily kind of see determine to have your analysis uh, hit that zone uh, zone of the three ring so because it's also an online method, uh, it's uh, possible to build a carbon isotope database, a large one with relatively low time commitment and effort compared to conventional methods. So you can do basic, you can basically do more uh, with less time. On the other hand, uh, the laser does limit a bit the type of source materials that can be used for three ring research uh, we have uh, analyzed whole wood uh, this is not a large problem because there is an uh, there appears to be a relatively stable uh, offset between whole wood and alpha cellulose uh, when alpha cellulose is what you traditionally use for uh, three ring research so you can correct your whole wood data to represent alpha cellulose uh, with relatively high certainty that that uh, this is a uh, reliable correction. And one other thing to keep in mind is that there is no established reference materials for for laser ablation stable isotope analysis. Uh, we have uh, resolved this issue by uh, using uh, homogenized uh, materials, uh, an in-house reference material, and a commercially available uh, isotope, stable isotope reference materials. And these uh, powders have been pressed uh, into pellets using a hydraulic manual uh, press. So uh, with this method, you uh, you obtain uh, obtain a sample that can be ablated similar to your unknowns and used to correct the stable isotope data. And uh, we have now talked mostly about tree rings and we'll continue talking about tree ring research. But uh, as a side note, uh, it is possible to also uh, adjust the method. Uh, to obtain data from other types of uh, sequentially growing materials, uh, we have tested it. We tested this uh, instrument with collagen, uh, but there is a uh, possibility to use it also on on other organic materials and other plant parts, uh, in addition to tree rings, for example. But now, uh, I will uh, give the floor so to speak, to my colleague, uh, Katja, Dr. Katja Rinnekarmsten, who will talk about more about these applications that we have used this uh, LAIRMS uh, in. Thank you, Elina. As introduced by Elina, I would now like to give you an overview of some of the research we have conducted involving laser ablation. The analytical method for high-resolution carbon isotope analysis was established and has been used at Stable Isotope Laboratory of Luke during my ongoing isoboreal project, which is funded by ERC and Academy of Finland. In this project, we are interested in the processes that lead to a given stable isotope signal in tree rings. For this purpose, for carbon isotopes, we have followed how an isotopic signal is modified along the pathway from atmospheric CO2 to sugars, and finally to the intraannual carbon isotope composition of tree rings. This knowledge enables us to obtain better reconstructions of environmental change from tree ring chronologies. 
This slide shows the principles of the described approach. Here you can see the vertical laser ablation tracks, each giving one carbonized stop result. The width and spacing of the tracks is 40 micrometers. The ob obtained intra-annual carbon isotope profile is one of the black series here. The other black series are replicate analysis of other trees from the same site. In this figure, the tree ring profiles are being compared with intraseasonal carbon isotope variability of sucrose in leaves. These values are in red. The comparison shows that the low frequency trend present in leaf carbohydrates for the synthates was preserved in tree rings. This is the weather data of the studied year. It shows that the low frequency trend identified in the tree ring carbon isotope series is that of vapor pressure deficit. However, we identified the highlighted time period when the VPD signal was not recorded in the tree ring carbon isotope series. Whereas the VPD values dropped at this time, as you can see in the highlighted area, the carbon isotope series contained a continued day increase. This was because the trees had to rely on carbon-13 enriched carbohydrate reserves for their growth during this period. The reason for this was soil moisture deficit. This study was published in tree physiology. In Isoboreal project, we have taken uh, our approach to another level and analyzed by now close to 5,000 laser ablation tracks. The studies from Isoboreal are yet unpublished, so I won't go to find details about the next slides that describe some of our findings. In this slide, we are looking at the application of laser ablation of tree rings on intrinsic water sufficiency reconstructions at intraseasonal level. The black series in this graph is the reconstructed intrinsic water sufficiency from tree ring carbon isotope composition. The reconstruction covers the growth period of tree rings for each studied year from 2002 to 2019. These series are compared to intrinsic water sufficiency reconstructions from leaf gas exchange and from eddy covariance data for the different years, shown here as the orange and blue series. This study showed general good agreement between the triggering reconstructed intrinsic water sufficiency and the reconstructions based on the instrumental data. In another study, we examined the impact of progressive drought on pine saplings. We had two treatment groups, trees that were affected by drought and were subsequently rewatered, and trees that received adequate watering during the entire experiment. From these trees, we obtained discs like the ones you can see here. And from these discs, we selected cross sections for laser placement analysis of the most recent annual ring. The obtained carbon isotope profiles are shown here for the droughted and for the control trees in red and blue color respectively. The x-axis shows the time of the year and the y-axis the measured carbon isotope values for the studied year. Between the two treatments, clear differences were observed for the low frequency carbon isotope variability. In this manuscript, we examine the reasons behind these differences. As the last example of this presentation, I would like to show you these tree ring carbon isotope profiles that cover years from 2010 to 2020. These laser ablation analyses were conducted for mature trees in a forest in Finland. We examined how a forest manipulation act affected trees on site. Also in this case, we had a control group whose isotope series are shown in blue. The trees exposed to the manipulation are in red and show a substantial and immediate response that lasted until the period of study. The interpretations are discussed in the manuscript script in preparation. Finally, Elena Sarsted and I would like to thank you for your attention and hope that you found the content of this presentation interesting and motivating. We can be contacted using the email address given here. 
Next, you will have the opportunity for questions and live discussions.